Well, good morning, everybody. Good Saturday morning. Uh, I don't know about you, but it's a really sh sunny, beautiful day here at Indy. Not too cold, not too hot. Uh, <clears throat> but today, it's, the weather's not too hot, but what about if your brakes are too hot? We're going to talk about brakes and heat and how to know how much your brakes are heating up uh, based off of a couple questions we got from the Speed Therapy Society, the Kenny Brown Speed Therapy Society private Facebook group. I got every single word in it. So I'm glad you could join me this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about this in a little bit. We've got some really good questions uh, that came in from the society. Remember, you can send in questions live. Uh, if you have any questions for me, I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. So why don't I move this out of the way for just a minute? There. I shake the whole thing. It's kind of heavy. Okay, so what else are we going to talk about this morning? Well, it's kind of like... Uh, how hot is hot is, this, is the, the main subject on tech for brake rotors. But also, uh, there's a little piece in here called What's Kenny's Working On? And we've got a pretty interesting uh, project uh, in the shop right now. Uh, uh, Andy Redman uh, has a 69 Boss uh, Mustang, which is a you know, pretty decent car. And, but he wanted, he wanted to know if we could do anything about the you know, stiffening up the chassis. And as luck would have it, when we were in Chicago, we prototyped a few uh, uh, chassis pieces for the Gen 1 Mustangs. So we thought, hey, yeah, bring it on in. We'll see, uh, see where we are on the pieces we, we built up there. Uh, so it's kind of like an R&D project. We can see what we need to maybe uh, modify going forward. And if there's enough interest, you know, we'll, we'll bring, this, uh, bring this product in, into the fold. And like chassis support's been our number one product since the 90s uh you know we first came out with the uh, uh double cross subframe connectors uh, which everybody's copied we first come out with jacking rails which everybody's copied and uh, the matrix system matrix uh, brace creates the matrix system and nobody's copied that i don't know why because that's the that's the key to creating a stiff chassis and you know, if uh, as, as we talk about the Speed Therapy Academy is going on right now, when we're in the chassis section, we're talking about the more rigid uh, the platform, the better the car will perform. And, and I show pictures of uh, race cars that are just tubes everywhere, tubes and lots of triangulation. I mean, triangles are the key. Triangles are the, you know, the, the most rigid engineering <coughs> shape there is. <coughs> so we'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, the questions and the uh, and the, the hot, the hot, the hot. Uh, so let me flip over to the page. Okay, so what should we start with? We should start with, uh, these are great questions. And it's, these, some of these questions are going to lead into what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but maybe, maybe why don't we start off with the, uh, with the Gen 1 uh, chassis support system. <clears throat> and this is a, this is a, a pretty unique, and a lot of you may or may not <clears throat> know about my, you know, the uh, matrix system chassis support. And like I say, it's a double cross subframe connectors, uh, jacking rails, and the matrix brace. All that together makes the matrix system. So with Gen One, a little bit different underneath. What we did, the double cross design just wasn't going to work. So this is what we kind of came up with. And this is like, that's kind of like a frame rail. And we go from, let's see, the front, which, you know, kind of slides up over the, the front subframe, and to the back, and this, this kind of welds in right where the, uh, where the, uh, excuse me, the, the bolt for the uh, shackle spring would go through here. So that's where it welds on the back. And it's extra hole or for something else we'll talk about in the coming weeks. But this is, uh, I mean, it's, it's not that heavy, but it, it's pretty rigid. And it does an amazing job. I mean, it's adding, it's like adding a, you know, a, a full subframe underneath the car. So that's, that's the inside. Now, on the outside, as luck would have it, this is the jacking rail. And as it turns out, this is the same jacking rail that we use on the Fox Mustangs and the S197s. 
So the same Jack Arrow for S197 and Fox also works on the, the Gen 1 uh, Mustangs. So that's kind of handy. Now this is the Matrix Brace, and it's a little bit different than our other Matrix Brace, specifically for this chassis, we had to put a little some, some hoop de doos in it. But the whole concept is, you know, we've got the, the uh, jacking rail on the outside, we've got the, the subframe on the inside, and when you look at it, we end up with one, two, three, four triangulations per side. Remember I said triangles are the, are the strongest engineering shape. And it really does, just just, just like on the uh, uh, on, on the, all our other Mustangs, the uh, Fox SN95 and S197, it really, really firms up the middle of the car. Now, when I say stiffen the chassis, some people think it's going to, you know, stiffen the ride. Absolute, absolutely the opposite. When you firm up the chassis, it's like all of a sudden you're losing squeaks and rattles and the platform feels really solid and it, the whole ride quality gets better because you're not letting the, 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 the actual the unibody itself become a fifth and unwanted suspension member moving around. You know, when, when the suspension is moving, if the body's moving with it, you know, suspension is really not doing its job. So when you start rigiding up that uh, that the uh, the chassis it lets the suspension do its job and it, it does amazing so this is like the uh, kind of like one of the prototypes that we did if there's enough interest uh we will put them back into production it'll take maybe a month or two but uh, if you know anybody that might be interested in matrix system for gen 1 mustangs let us know i think the thing we're going to run into though with, with all these cars that are 50 years old is nothing's going to be an exact fit I think anybody that puts it on has to be in their mind thinking that, you know, the car's 50 years old, things have changed. Maybe people have, have done some work on it and it's not, the jacking roll will be fine on the outside. The matrix will be okay, but the subframe, uh, you may need to twiddle and tweak with it a little bit just because, you know, 50 year old cars, they move around a lot. People have re replaced the floor pan uh, in, in some. So, but anyway, it, it will do an amazing job of firming up the chassis and then also improving ride, taking away squeaks and rattles. So that was uh, that was our sort of our, what's Kenny's working on. Uh, it was nice to be able to have like a real uh, 69, uh, it's the Boss 390. So it's, it, I just can't believe how they squeeze those engines in. I mean, there's almost like no room uh, with, with the 390 in there, but it's okay. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a cool car. So let's moving on to <clears throat> our questions. <clears throat> I'm going to start with, with Ben's question. Ben Balmer, he's actually an alumni of the Speed Therapy Academy. And uh, he had a question that we posted up that we, I, I kind of answered, but I thought it was a good question to bring into Saturday morning. And his question was, he had, he's converting his uh, it's a SN95 to an IRS car. Hey, we like IRS Mustangs. And his question is, are the ring and, pinion, ring and pinion gears and differential used in the IRS the same as a live axle? Well, the answer is a quantified yes. Uh, it all fits, okay? What you have to be aware of is the splines on the axle. If you've got an early uh, uh, IRS, it's gonna have the, the 28 spline differential. And the, I think the axles on, on most of the SN95 cars are 28 splines. So that would drop right in. If it is a 0304 uh, with the Terminator motor, that's going to have a 31 spline. And you, you can easily get 31 spline axles anywhere. So it, it, it will fit. I mean, everything's kind of the same. It's all 8.8. .8. It's just a matter of do you have the right axles to work in. <clears throat> so, okay, moving on from there. Uh, this, this, is, this is another great question. Uh, I, I like this one. This is from uh, Mike uh, Bowman. Uh, it's no secret that the Fox body Mustang has been gaining in popularity in recent years. Given that, have you ever thought about building resto modded Fox body and applying the knowledge and equipment that has been learned over the past several decades? Think of it as a continuation of the outlaw Mustang. Well, for those who have not been around for, you know, the, 
30 plus years we've been doing this. Back in the uh, in the late Fox era, we built a series of cars that were called Outlaws. And <laughs> they were really cool cars. And uh, we did a whole bunch of stuff to them and had kind of like a small cow hood, but which made them distinguish. But and, and my entire performance platform, chassis, suspension, wheels, tires, brakes. That's the five things that makes my cars great. And uh, so to answer your question, we're already partially there. The uh, our K member for the SN95 for 94 and 95 SN95 with the Windsor five liter, uh, that will fit in a Fox. You have to do a little bit of a whittling uh, on a couple places and move a couple lines, but that's all in the instructions what to do, but it, it will fit. So that, that's a modern uh, K, K member and with good geometry in the front. And of course, that converts it to coilover. And with that, we always would recommend that you go to a 96 and newer spindle uh, for, from the SN95. You don't want 94 or 95. You want 96 and newer because the steering geometry is way better 96 and newer. That gives you five, you know, five bolt in the front and or five lug in the front. And then the IRS in the back is five lugs. So we've got a lot of guys doing that. It's a really, really nifty package. As far as the, as far as the uh, live axle cars, now back in the uh, in the in the 80s and 90s, we had a really really nice rear suspension system. Uh, we call it Track Kit Plus, which was it had the axle brackets to imp improve anti squat, and it also had a panner bar to lower the factory roll center. Factory roll center in the live axle car with, with double splayed control arms is like way up up in the trunk. Now when I say roll roll center, that's the back of the car. The car wants to roll around going around the corner which is why those older cars really kind of do this going around the corner. Well, it's about 17, 18 inches high. It's been a long time since I did the geometry. But by adding a panner bar, now wherever the panner bar crosses the center line of the car, that becomes your roll center. So we use the panner bar to defeat the factory roll center, which is really high, and introduce a new roll center at the bottom of the differential, which is where I always put my, my panner bars, my roll centers at the bottom of the differential. Uh, that goes all the way back to the Trans Am days. I mean, a watch link is the best way to locate an axle, but wherever the center pin in is your roll center, and you just can't get them down very low. Plus, you have to add a whole bunch of, you know, brackets and, and frames and things like that. In the Trans Am days, we would take a, a watch link and mount it horizontal on the bottom of the differential, and that was easy because they had underslung chassis, so that we get the, the benefit of the watts with the, with the roll center at the bottom of the diff. Well, we did the same thing in our uh, track kit plus, we moved the, the, the panner bar down to the bottom of the differential uh, to, to bring the roll center down there. Exact same thing we do in the S197s, roll low roll center. The problem was uh, after we, you know, after I, I took, you know, many years off for, for uh, some health stuff and we started bringing products back, we've not brought back the, uh, the, uh, the track kit plus system. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it worked really, really well, but it really turned into one of those, uh, I'm gonna say a kind of pain in, in, in the butt for us. Cause there's, back then there was a whole bunch of different exhaust systems. And anyway, it's got a Fox SN95, you look under the back, there's very little real estate to work with. And what would happen is we had to think five different frames for the panel bar, depending on which, which exhaust system you had. And we would engineer it so that the exhaust system fit, no problem. Uh, but we have people in the field when they install it, they've complained that the, uh, the, uh, the, the bracket for the panner bar was hitting the exhaust. In reality, the exhaust was hitting the bracket and it was really hard to make them understand that they need to do a little different installation on that so it doesn't hit. And, and you have to add a lot of extra room because people don't realize that when exhaust systems get hot, they expand. They grow, they get bigger. You know, when things get hot, they, they get bigger. So that was one thing. The other thing is because the we're using it as a, for a roll center and not axle location, not lateral location on the axle. It has to be, the banner bar has to be set at right height on the ground uh, with, with uh, you know, like at least a half a tank of gas in it at, uh, at zero preload, which means you need to be able to slide a bolt in and out uh, without any problem. Uh, zero preload. What we would do is people wouldn't read the instructions and they would not have the panner bar adjusted correctly. So what would happen is the panner bar would be either pushing or pulling on the differential 
while the, the control arms were trying to center it. So they'd be constantly fighting against each other. When you start creating load and stress, you know, it, something's got to give. So th those are the two things. I mean, it was a great product, but it, it came down to, let's say, the end user uh, uh, became sort of an issue. My plan is, well, right now, you know, we're working, we're working with a lot of guys, putting the IRS in, in the Fox SN95s. I mean, that's really cool. Maybe in a year or so, what my plan is to uh, do a bolt-in, a, a brand new bolt-in four link for the Fox SN95. It's, don't get excited. It's at least a year away uh, with, uh, with a, uh, obviously the same geometry we're running in the S197 right now, which is amazing. And also a, a double wishbone for the front. Uh, a long time ago, I, I did one uh, for a, a friend of mine. Uh, back when I, I was still struggling with, with uh, uh, some health stuff. Uh, in 03, 04, uh, we did a, uh, we partnered with Ford Racing on a double wishbone SLA for, there was going to be a bolt-in for S197. This was like before the S197 came out. And uh, uh, they, uh, Ford Racing, they lost a lot of budget. So Dan Davis said, why don't you just take and finish it yourself? So I worked with Buddy Fay, uh, a race car engineer I know, and uh, a quicker CAD up in, uh, in uh, Detroit. And we developed a bolt-in uh, SLA for the 197s that actually has the front geometry that mirrors uh, the late uh, Riley J and Pratt and Miller Trans Am cars. So it, it's pretty cool. Uh, that has been sitting on a shelf for years and years and years. We're actually going to start working on that again. But again, that's that's many months off. But once we get that done, uh, way back, I guess, I think maybe 2008, 2009, uh, uh, Steve Post came to me. Actually, his dad, Jim Post, came to me, who's passed now, which is a shame because he was a really good guy. Uh, and they wanted, you know, they wanted a better suspension. So we tried to, a friend of mine who used to work, be a fabricator at Riley and Scott, the race car company, uh, we tried to adapt the S190. So I had like three prototypes. Uh, I went ready to adapt the, uh, uh, the, the SLA from the S197. SLA, by the way, stands for short long arm. Uh, that's a double wishbone where the upper arm is shorter than the lower arm. Uh, so if you're wondering what SLA is. Anyway. It, there's no way we could get it to fit. So what we did is I took, I, I recalculated. I mean, I had all, all the dimensions and measurements uh, for the suspension. So what I did is, I mean, I, I spent a day and took all my numbers or recalculated. And I ended up uh, drawing on the floor with a Sharpie the suspension. And next to each point, you know, I wrote the elevation, you know, from the floor. Uh, you know, I, I calculated how far up I had to be from the floor. And uh, and he just, he just, it's just built the thing in midair and it worked like a dream. There is an extra set of parts still, I believe, for that uh, up in Chicago. Uh, and at some point I need to get up and get them. I, I hope they're still there. Uh, so that's, that, that's, you know, we're talking, again, we're talking a year away uh, for a double wishbone and a bolt-in four link for the back because the, the IRS parts are getting pretty thin. So, I mean, I hope that answers your question. It's, it's, it, it, it. It's been playing on my brain for a long time. I, mean, I wanted to do the uh, uh, a real suspension for Fox SN95 for for years and years and years. It's just we're we're getting close to being able to do it, but like I say, we've got a couple of projects ahead of it. Uh, and and then also the uh, the, the SLA and the uh, the four link, the bolt in four link. We're also going to adapt the Gen One Mustangs with and the SLA for the front. So, I mean, there, there are some big projects I got lined up. Uh, you know, uh, they're, they're down the road, though. I mean, we only can do a couple things at a time. We just spent a whole bunch of years uh, developing and testing the uh, matri the uh, K-Link, which we brought to market here recently, which is the most amazing rear suspension in the world. So, anyway, that, that's kind of like the answer for, for your Fox question. Uh, here's, a, here's another good one. Uh, Gavin Wheeler is worth rebuilding a 463 valve engine, or should I swap it out for a 5 liter Coyote in an early uh, body S197? Well, you can do either one. It boils down to basically boils down to what's your budget? Are you doing it yourself? You having somebody else do it, and the, the time you have to invest in it. 
like just dropping in a uh, coyote is not as easy easy and simple as saying you have a drop in. But you have to also consider you're going to need the controller unit to go with it. And I've, I've never done this, so I'm just kind of working off the top of my head. Uh, somebody out there may have more information on this than me. But then you have to think about, okay, how do we integrate the, uh, the, the processor and the electronics of the coyote uh, 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 processor into the dash on the early S, uh, S197. And then you've got to get, you know, you've got to get headers. And, and uh, I don't think that the, the coyote motors, I think they're like around 10, 11 grand. And then the controller pack is you know, 27, 2800 bucks. So right there, I mean, you're, you're in probably just starting out into it like 15 grand for parts. And then, I mean, the whole bunch of other stuff, I'm sure I'm missing that you have to have to get to adapt uh, the coyote to it. Uh, and, and then, you know, you to use the same transmission, get a different transmission, it, it all kinds of, you have to, you have to think the whole project through and, you know, you know, put pencil to paper and figure out what it's going to cost, but it is possible. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, yeah, you just want you to be aware of the things you don't just, you know, grab one and stick it in. You have to think the whole process through. Like I say, if you do, if you've got a project, think of the end and then work backwards of all the steps you have to do, uh, until you get back to the beginning so it works out now the other thing you can do which is pretty easy is uh, we we just did this to uh uh clip glidden's uh, uh 2008 uh, ford racing fr 500 s you know the race cars that were on the mustang challenge it's unique he's, he's in reno but this happens to be one of the cars that i engineered in the mustang challenge in 2009 and 10. Uh, and what we did is we upgraded his car to 2011 World Challenge specs. Uh, at the end of 2010, the Mustang Challenge ceased to exist, but the, the SCCA allowed his FR500S into the World Challenge GTS class, with, but they allowed some updates. You know, the Boss Mustangs had to run pretty much as they were, uh, but for the, the, uh, the for FR500S, they could run my AGS 4.0 suspension, which is a big plus. Plus Ford Racing had a, a power upgrade and it consisted of heads, intake, cam, throttle body. Okay, now you already had headers on the car. So the, the heads that Ford used to make are no longer available. Uh, so I went to uh, my, my friends at Livernois up in Detroit uh, and got a set of, they've got for the three valves, they've got a stage one, stage two, stage three. Uh, so I got, it wasn't a full on race car, and stage one just wasn't warm enough. So I went for a stage two uh, cylinder head porting and they do just, just a beautiful job. If you ever need some cylinder head work done, uh, get a hold of livenoids or get a hold of me and I'll tell you who to talk to up there. So anyway, we did that and to be consistent with the Ford uh, uh, upgrade. So this was sort of re retain the integrity of the car. We use the Ford hot rod camshafts now there's there's better camshafts out there than that, but we wanted to stick to you know the the official package that Ford had. That Ford's got a really nice intake for the three valves and a bigger throttle body, and didn't touch pretty much didn't touch the bottom end. Oh, we did because the heads are off and and the timing chains are off, which we always replace. We put in a billet oil pump, which any any time you've got the front off of a modular car, you want to stick a, a steel billet oil pump in there. Anyway, I mean that that was kind of like not a lot of not a lot of work, not a lot of effort, and plus then everything hooks up the same. You know, everything plugs in the same. Uh, we went to the dyno and uh, we worked with uh, Tony at HP Tuners. Uh, we actually do our our dyno tuning remotely. Uh, you know, we're, we're on the dyno and, and Tony is either in Chicago or Florida or whoever he may be, and uh, we work back and forth. And what we ended up with. Uh, is there's like 300 and 380, 381 rear wheel horsepower. And if you do the math, that's like uh, 440, which is pretty close to what I think the uh, the boss motors were 444. So, I mean, that, that's a pretty hefty increase. Uh, now the new boss, new Coyote motors are what, 460 horse. Uh, I think the boss motor, the Gen 1, uh, Coyotes were 440, 444, and with uh, with with just what I described, we were at uh, 380 rear wheel, uh, 440 at uh, the crank, 
uh, with uh, a little better camshaft, we easy would have been uh, 450. So, I mean, it's just a couple of ways to look at it. I mean, if you want to talk about it more uh, and, and deeper, uh, please uh, sign up for uh, one of my 50 minute consults. I'll be more than happy to talk to you about it and give you more detail of what we did on Cliff's car because it turned out really, really well. I mean, the engine is smooth as silk. It pulls like crazy. Here, here's a dyno, and you can actually see how just how how smooth the dyno curves are. I mean, both the torque and the power is smooth and linear. I mean, the car pulls like a freight train. So, I mean, yes, yes, you can put the Coyote in, but I want you to think about all the other things you have to get with it and what you have to do to adapt it to the chassis. Uh, so... That's that. I hope uh, hope that was uh, was uh, was helpful. That was Gavin Wheeler, by the way. And uh, Gavin, if you need more information, uh, please give me a call. And the other things you have to think about if you're going to a, a, a Coyote, uh, the, your three valve has like a, a, a six bolt crank. Coyotes have an eight bolt, so then you also have to get a clutch and flywheel. So I mean, these are just tons of little things you have to consider. So anyway, that's uh, that's 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 my that's my uh, what uh, opinion on that. Uh, and this is uh, from uh, Jerry. Uh, I have a 2014 197 uh, purchased our jacking rails. Good for you. You're gonna love them. Uh, I, I put the Roush side splitters on. Will this affect the installation of the jacking rails and how the car will sit on jack stands? Uh, I don't want to damage the side splitters. Okay, I'm rich is a better person to ask this to, but my understanding that we just did, actually just did one of these not too long ago. Uh, uh, Brian from uh, uh, the Speed Therapy Academy, uh, he brought in his 427 Roush and we put the full AGS 4.5 suspension on it and, uh, and the matrix system. And he had the side splitters. And I believe, okay, I believe the side splitters are outside the pinch weld and the jacking rail goes on the pinch weld to the pinch weld. And I, I think there's like spaces where maybe that the the, 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 the the OE jack would go in there, the jack of the car, and I think the, the jack uh, uh, the jacks jack stands would fit right there. Uh, so I, I, I the answer is yes because we've done it, but I I wasn't under the car, and uh, I uh, Rich would be a better person to ask that question to. But yeah, and, and go ahead and put them both on. So let's see, we've got. Uh, now we're going to get to Rob and Bill on uh, on uh, uh, rotor temperature. Okay, this is this is Rob's question. Now, you have, if you've been with me a while, you know I'm always talking about knowing what the what your rotor temperature is, so that you can match up uh, match up the brake pad compound. It, it's really important that your brake compound is 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 matched up. To your rotor temperature. Uh, that's how they're going to work the best. If, if you got rotor temperatures higher than than the compound was designed for, uh, you got to, the, the wear factor is going to be really high. You're going to wear them out really fast. If you've got a compound that is higher than what your rotor uh, temperature is, then what's going to happen is is the brakes are, aren't going to work that well. They'll probably squeal, uh, and, and they just won't have have a good grip. We have had had that. Uh, First-hand experience, we had a gentleman I was talking to from New York or Connecticut, I believe, and he had a GT500 that he was he was putting on track, and we were helping him with it. And I, I said, well, we've got these really great brake pads, these uh, uh, G-Log brake pads, which I can get pre-bedded for you so you don't have to bed them. And he said, I, I tried them, and they, they don't work at all. I said, well, what compound did you have? And he, he the compound he told me was the absolute top-end race pad. Okay, I mean it works to 2,100 degrees. It does. It, it's the lowest temperature is like 600. So you really need to have for a, a brake uh, pad like that. You really need it to be the 14, 1600 uh, temperature range. And he, he said the same thing. He said they make noise. It didn't stop very well. Well, that's, that's the, the, the person that sold them to him had no idea, had no no concept. Of brake pads, and he just thought, well, it's a GT500. I'll give him the, you know, the, 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 the uh, most, the biggest, best uh, pad, race pad, and it, it doesn't work. He needed to be three compounds down from that race pad. So anyway, that, that's why you have to match. But the only way to, to really know, but if you call me, I can, I can 
I can talk to you about that. My my car typically ran with brake ducts. Now, remember, brake ducts are important if you're going on track. My my car typically ran about 1,200 degrees on the rotor temperature. Uh, so that, that's why I keep talking about rotor temperature. And without without brake ducts, I would have been 1,600 degrees easy. So brake ducts are really important. They help they help uh, keep temperature under control, which means the, the brakes work better, the brake pads last longer, and your rotors last longer. So it's all good things. So, but getting back to uh, his question, uh, can you use uh, temperature melting crayons to determine rotor temperature? The crayons are used in welding to determine the temperature of metal when metal needs to be preheated. Different colors melt at different temperatures. I was wondering if I could mark three veins with three different colors to determine my temperature or maybe map, ma mark the back of the pads. Okay, forget about the back of the pads. You know, you don't want to know what the back of the pad temperature is. You want to know what the temperature of the pad against the rotor is. Now, I don't, I don't know what the heat ranges are on those crayons, uh, and if, you know, if they melt, you know, will they get on on the rotor uh, and you know get on the pads? Uh, what we use is rotor temperature paint. Now, let me pull my handy dandy display up here. Now, this is one of, one of our uh, bare brake packages. And what I use, what we use is uh, rotor temperature paint. And the nice thing about it is just one color. You can see you point, you, you paint it on, and you don't want, you don't want to put the, your crayons on the veins. You want to put them on the rotor, rotor itself, not the veins, because the veins are going to be a lower temperature than, than, the, than the, the outside. And that's where you want to know what's, what's the temperature right here. What's that temperature between the rotor and the brake pad? And the nice thing about it is it goes on. That's the color it goes on as. But as it goes through different heat cycles, you can see that it changes colors. Okay. And, you know, the different colors are I actually had it upside down. Okay. Now, it's, uh, the first one is... Uh, I had well. I, I, it, it, the high is at the bottom. The uh, the low is goes up to 687 Fahrenheit. Uh, the second, the red brown, goes to 804. The uh, what color is that? The brown goes to uh, 1074. The yellow green goes to 1326, and that's typically where where my rotors are. And then the green goes up to 1470. And then the, the beige is uh, above uh, 1471. So if, you're, if your crayons uh, are good between, I'm going to say, uh, 900 and, and 1400 degrees, you can use them, but they have to be on the outside. And you know, my, my concern is if they melt, well, well they, they get on, on, you know, on the road. I mean, I don't know that much about them. I'm just you know, making guesses. So you know, the, the, better, the better would be to use you know, brake rotor temperature paint. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's got let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six different uh, temperature ranges. And I'm not sure what temperature ranges your crayons are at. So why we're thinking about, why we're thinking about rotor, uh, brakes and rotors, uh, just a couple more tips. Now, you'd be surprised how many times we get cars and the rotors are installed backwards. Uh, we had one customer with a boss that, uh, uh, somebody was working on his, his car that, you know, honestly just wasn't very good. And he kept burning up brakes. And even though he had brake ducts, he kept burning up brakes. So he, he brought it in to get that and a whole bunch of other things fixed. And sure enough, the uh, the rotors were on backwards. Okay. And uh, because of that, uh, they don't cool. Now, a rotor cools from the inside out and the veins are always pointing backwards. And he's pointing outwards. And when you have a slotted rotor, remember, never, ever, never, ever, ever, ever use drilled rotors. Uh, I unconditionally, 120% guarantee that they will crack at the holes. Absolutely guaranteed. No question about it. That's why we only use slotted rotors. Slotted rotors do two things. One, they help clear brake dust. And secondly, they help relieve the gas pressure that builds up between the rotor and the brake pad at the trailing edge of the brake pads. Uh, when brakes get really hot, they'll build up 
they'll build, if there's no place for the gas to go, they'll build up at the back of the pad and the pads will wear unevenly. Back when we were doing the Celine cars, we had to run stock rotors, which were smooth, no, no, uh, no uh, grooves. And, you know, we do, they run 24 hour races. We do maybe two brake changes. And every time we pull the brakes off, the front of the brake pad was just, you know, starting to touch the metal and the back half, it was still half a pad in the back. That's because the gas pressure built up in the back. We well, got these handy slots and that relieves that pressure. The other thing that is important to know is these slots should always take place forward. Okay. Yeah, a lot of people think, you know, it's racy, you know, they station point backwards, but no, they need to paint uh, uh, face forward. So uh, the thing is that, and you can tell if you go and you can feel the road, see that the, the vein is going this way. Okay. So if, if you're going forward, if these slots are going forward, it's going to help vent because you always want to get air to the oh, sorry, air to the eye of the rotor, which is right here, uh, because they, they cool from the inside out. Now our, our brake ducts, I don't have one here, but uh, my brake ducts are pretty unique. It's a three inch squash down so that 100% of the air goes into the eye of the rotor so they cool better. Than, uh, than like a four inch brake duct, even though you think a four inch brake duct would be better, it, uh, it doesn't cool as well as my three inch because all the air goes into the eye of the rotor with a four inch brake duct. Half the air goes in the eye, half the air hits the face of the rotor, so you end up with two different temperatures outside and inside. So that kind of, that should, that answers uh, uh, the other question, Bill's question that goes into that is kind of use an infrared parameter uh, to measure brake rotor temperature or a brake probe that is a tire parameter. Uh, yes, you can use them, but it's only going to tell you the temperature that the brakes, that the rotors are at. And they've, more than likely, they have cooled down quite a bit. The temperature you want to know is what is the peak temperature under braking? You know, what's the hottest these the rotors get to? And if, if you watch like, you know, Daytona or Le Mans at night, uh, you can see the brake rotors glowing bright red. Well, they're going from you know one temperature way up to bright red and then they cool back down. Well, if you use if you use it like an infrared or, or, or a parameter, uh, you're not going to find out what peak temperature is. I mean, this is that you know, the best way to find out what your peak temperature is is with uh, rotor paint. Okay, uh, did I get through everything? Uh, yeah, I think I got through absolutely everything on my list of questions. And we talked about the uh, we talked about the uh, matrix system for the Gen One Mustangs. Uh, so I guess uh, now we can turn to your questions if you have any. I don't know if we've got any questions there or not. I was kind of rattling on, but I think sure. I hit everything on the list. Sure, there's a couple of que uh, questions, Kenny. But first, I have to add my few little tidbits. Um, so I uh, wanted to let everybody know that this is, especially newcomers, that this is Simulcast Live on uh, the Kenny Brown Performance Facebook page, the Kenny Brown Speed Therapy Facebook group, as well as Kenny's uh, YouTube channel, the Kenny Brown Performance YouTube channel. So if you, um, there's lots of people viewing from different areas. So uh, join us. Hey, you know what, Carrie? What? I think I forgot to say. This is Cars and Coffee with Kenny Brown in the beginning. And I didn't catch you either. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like it's bad, bad on both of us. Do you want so, to say that right now? Okay. I'm Kenny Brown, and this is Cars and Coffee, where I take about an hour or so to answer your questions and talk a little tech and try to share some of my extensive knowledge of, you know, 50-some years of doing this and a lot of years in professional motorsports. Uh, I've won a lot of national championships, too, in racing, so... Uh, I've got a little bit of knowledge, but I share what I can. And if, I, if I don't know the answer, uh, I'll tell you. I mean, I'm, I, mean I, I know a lot, but I don't know everything. Uh, and, and when it comes to answers, if I don't know the answer, I, I just tell you I don't know the answer. I've got like an engineering brain, so that whole BS thing, I just, my head doesn't work that way. So you know, what, what you get is like real information. So with that, <laughs> Now can we talk about questions? Oh, no, of course not. I have to gab a little bit. So uh, a couple things to share. First of all, if you like what Kenny's sharing, let's see some love. Let's give him some thumbs up. 
um, click on the little button if you're in uh, either Facebook or in the and on the YouTube channel. So let's see some love from for Kenny. Um, also, uh, Kenny, I don't know if you know about this yet, uh, but uh, Kenny is uh, over the holiday season. We uh, both Christmas and New Year, since it kind of like lands on the holiday, we're going to be doing something different. We're going to be, uh, Kenny's going to be doing his top 10 tech tips for the year for 2021. So if you have a tech tip that you think uh, should be on that list, especially the, all the um, people that show up all the time, I'll list a few of them here that I know are here. Steve Hansford, Dave Robinson from Niagara, yay, you're always here. Joe Johnson, Kobe Ward. Uh, Roy Merrick uh, is always here. Steve Smith, Fred Francher never misses anything. He's from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so we have a lot of people. And if I haven't mentioned your name, uh, I apologize. But also, Kelvin Goring. So if any of you long uh, um, people that listen every week, uh, if you want to just list, put in the comments before, below what you think Kenny's top, he should include in his uh, top tips for 2021, that would be appreciated. So with that, we can go to questions, Kenny. Okay. Um, and I just need to get back to my place. Um, I need an assistant, I think. There we go. Steve Smith, my, I do have an assistant. I consider putting a Coyote in a 20, uh, 2016 S. 197 v6 but after doing the research i decided to sell it and i purchased a 2012 gt that was a good choice steve wouldn't you say uh yeah i mean it, it makes a lot of sense i mean you you can uh you know swap them out but here, here's the thing when you go to if you just get a, like an 11 to 14 with a coyote uh you get a couple of things like one of the big things you get is a bigger ball joint in the front uh, like we, for our, our front grip gets 197s, we do not make control arms for the 5 to 10 cars, uh, just simply because they have a smaller 18 millimeter shaft on the ball joint. And when we run the extended ball joint to bring the roll center up, uh, it puts a lot of load on it. So we no longer, no longer build those. Uh, we only build the 11 to 14 control arms with the larger 19 millimeter uh, shaft on the ball joint. Uh, so what we have is people with the, the early cars, uh, you know, just go out to, you know, on the, uh, scour the, you know, the salvage yards or eBay and come up with a set of spindles and they, they fit. I mean, there's no problem. Everything fits. And then you get a much bigger ball joint. So that, that's, that's one of the advantages for the, uh, uh, for the 11 to 14s among many. Plus all those Coyote motors are just so cool. I, I just think that's probably the best engine Ford's ever put out. Uh, and then the newer ones keep getting better and better. But even so, even 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 the early ones, like the Gen ones in the uh, in the uh, 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 eleven to fourteens, I had a I had a two thousand twelve GT that was my track car. Uh, it was a, a GT four RS, wicked fast. I mean, it was wicked fast, and it was like I keep telling people: chassis, suspension, wheels, tires, brakes. You know, I had the, my full suspension. I had really great JRZ shocks and great big, big Kenny Brown bear brakes on it uh, and a little bit of arrow. And, I mean, I would chase, I mean, GT500s, a track like Road America, which is a really, you know, supposedly a horsepower track. Uh, GT500s down the straight, like between three and five, uh, I'd just go past them. I'd, I'd fly past them because I carried so much more speed in, in the corners, I had better exit speed. My foot was down. I carried speed. It was faster. <coughs> so, but I mean, then the only only thing I did the engine. Okay, the uh, the the first engine we had a problem with, and I happened to uh, have some friends at Ford, so I got one of the the uh, engines that were gone in the Boss S cars, and there was nothing special about them. They were just an engine uh, a three hundred two by a, a, a Boss three hundred two motor out of production. Uh, so I put that in. Uh, so it was just, uh, you know, a, a little newer uh, Coyote. Uh, cold air kit, headers, exhaust, and tune. And, you know, it was like uh, 440 to the ground, which is, you do the math, that's over 500 horsepower. But even so, I mean, just cold air headers and a tune and a really great suspension. Remember chassis, suspension, wheels, tires, brakes? Uh, 
and that car was just blazing fast. I mean, blazing fast. Uh, people would be, I mean, people would be surprised. We got one video uh, out there somewhere at Road America where turn 14 is the last turn before the uphill, the long straightaway up the hill. And I was, I was closing in on, on a Viper and I actually had to back out of it a little bit uh, for fear of running into the Viper in the middle of the corner. Uh, so I backed out and then when he got out clear, I put my foot back down again and I carried so much exit, more, more exit speed off the corner that that Viper never caught me all the way down the straightaway. And you know, we've got it documented in video. Uh, and it's also in that same tape, we also put another little clip in there where I totally, totally uh, outbraked a uh, Porsche GT3 RS. And that was an older one. Okay. I want to quantify that, you know, full, full disclosure. It was an older Porsche, but nevertheless, there's a, uh, I must, I must have come from five car lengths back, uh, going into turn five. And before we got the apex, I mean, I was, I was in his trunk and I, I always use my brakes in track days to intimidate people. Because if you if you can come from way back, because you know, the 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 braking capability, my GT4 uh, uh, suspension with rear grip kit, front grip kit, good springs and shocks, and good brakes, uh, the braking capability is just phenomenal. And I mean, I, I do would do that in in track days. And on racing, you know, your best opportunity to pass is under braking, which is why I focus so heavily on braking in the design of my suspensions. But in and, and this one, I mean, I would come, to, if, if people were pesky, I'd lay way back, I like on a long straightaway and going into a, a sharp corner, I would just, you know, close way down and just like be right there in all three mirrors by the time they hit the apex, they get flustered and just let me by. So in racing, we use it to, you know, to gain an advantage and, and pass people. In track days, I use it to intimidate the guys that won't get out of my way. Okay, I got kind of off on, on, a, on a long subject there. So let's get back to questions. Okay, uh, so Steve Smith, uh, can you give a rough idea when the front SLA suspension for the S197 will be available to purchase? Uh, I'm going to say we have the, the 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 big the big thing we need to do is like you know that the, the biggest part of the next phase of development. Uh, doing like I, I've got a I have a fixture for the for the you know the frame for the K member. Uh, the control arms are, are pretty simple to make. Uh, the, the thing that it is, the complexity is the spindle. Now, the, this, it was engine, this, the, the, uh, the uh, SLA was engineered as a race suspension, you know, based off of Trans Am cars. So the way it turned out is the spindles were built just like you would for an Indy car or a Trans Am car maybe 18, 20 pieces of really, really thin steel all TIG welded together, and they make an extremely strong and rigid and light uh, spindle. And then we, we have, what we did is the bearings on the uh, the 197s are always suspect, especially if you have, have a bad habit of running across curbs or, or alligator teeth. So we, we have a bearing pack on there that's, you know, the, the bearing and the hub just bolt right on, and uh, it, it's rated for for armored cars and, and everything else. Uh, we need to, we need, it's like, it would, it's really difficult, be difficult to put that product into production uh, without having a, a huge price tag on it. Uh, if you can imagine what it would take to sit down and, you know, TIG weld uh, 18 little pieces of steel into a finished product. So our next step is we need to <coughs> get together with an engineer who can draw it up and we need to convert that to a billet an aluminum billet, uh, so they're much easier to produce. And you know, we've got machining centers that can just spit them out. Uh, so that's kind of like the net. Once we get past that, uh, I'm guessing I'll, I'll do some updates. I'm, I'm guessing maybe six months, uh, maybe by spring. If, if you know, fingers crossed, if things go really, really well, uh, maybe in a couple of weeks, I'll show you guys some pictures of the originals. And uh, uh, when we get close, when we get the spindle figured out. Uh, I'll show you guys some pictures so you can kind of get an idea of what it is, but it's, it's racy. I mean, this is real race car stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's sooner than it would have been last year at this time. Let's put it that way. But as in, we've, we've got, we've, we've got a body in here. We've got the suspension mocked up. It's just a matter of getting time with the, with, with our manufacturing partners, 
uh, to see when they can start working on the spindle. So yeah, it's, 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 I'm, I'm really, I would really like to have this come out by spring because that matches our AGS 4.5, the uh, uh, the rear grip kit with, with my uh, patented uh, K-Link at the back. And that whole system together becomes AGS 5.0 or the fifth generation of my advanced geometry suspension systems that go all the way back to the Selene days in 86 and 87. Well, so, this I, mean, I, I have no idea how badly I want to get this done, so I'm working on it. Well, this question time uh, ties in pretty well, Kenny. Um, but before I say that, there's uh, lots of nice tech tips coming in. Uh, again, Kenny's going to be talking about the top tech tips uh, that he's offered in 2021. So uh, if you want to add something that you think should go on his top 10, please put it in the comments area. Here's Dave Robinson on the subject of the Resto Mod Fox bodies with the AGS 4.5 system fix the Fox. No doubt some adjustments would be needed. Uh, the answer is, that's my intent. Okay, when we do the bolt-in four-link, uh, it's going to have uh, the same geometry as we have in the S197. And I, I want to be able to put the, uh, uh, the K-link on the back with that. So, yeah, I mean, that's, we get, need to get the front, the, the, the front SLA we need to get done first. And then we're, it's, we're either going to do the, uh, uh, the bolt-in four-link for the, the, the Fox SN95 or for Gen 1 Mustangs. It just kind of depends on uh, where, where the market seems to be and where the most interest is. But they're, they're all in line to come out here. I mean, I've got, uh, you know, you think, you look back, look what's out there. And, I mean, I, I, I'll be honest, I, I know what's out there in the market. Uh, and there isn't anybody that can match the suspensions I build. I mean, I've been doing this for so long. I mean, it's I have made so many mistakes, you know, that, you know, when, when you're learning this stuff, you know, when, when I was younger, learning all this stuff, it's all trial and error and, you know, mostly error. But, you know, when, when, you, when you screw up, that just tells you what not to do next time. So I always look at when, when I, I don't get something right is that still I learn something and still move forward. So, uh, yeah, and I've been working on geometry, specifically on suspension geometry since 86, 87 saline cars. So that's, that's why I think I've got really good suspension systems. Okay, we have uh, a few. I got off of my little tangent again. We have a few questions left, um, but uh, I wanted to, so put your questions in the comments for Kenny to answer live. Uh, Robert Bowman says, what kind of mods can you make for a 4.6 three valve to get more low RPM power for autocross? Uh Depends on you know how much you know, what do you consider low RPM power? I mean the, uh, the what we did to uh, the Cliffs car. Uh, I mean let's see RPMs. I mean at, at four thousand RPMs we're at uh, uh, about two fifty horsepower, but more importantly we're at about uh, three thirty torque, and and it's it's not you know if you're thinking about Autocross, forget horsepower. Okay, uh, you want to be int more interested in torque. Uh, there's, there's a in, in, you know, in, in, in the professional racing ranks, there's a saying that horsepower sells engine, torque wins races. So you, you want to be focused on is torque. You want to get more torque at the bottom end. And what we did the Cliffs car, I mean, it's like 300 pounds of torque from 2,500 to about 3,800, and then it jumps up to uh, 340 in torque. So the torque curve, I don't know if you can, let's see, the torque curve is a flat one. The one that kind of goes up, that's horsepower, but what you want to know is torque. That's, that's the torque curve and the modifications we made. Now, along those lines, uh, if, you, if you've got a good engine builder, uh, there are certain camshafts that would be better for low end torque. And the other thing too, it, <coughs> you can adjust cam timing by a degree or two to move your entire torque curve down. So, I mean, the, the same things we did, uh, I mean, that's, that's pretty darn good torque. I mean, 300 pounds from, uh, from 2,500 on up uh, is, is, is pretty good. So it's like, if you're looking for, for improved performance in autocross, you want to look at torque. What's the torque curve look like? 
Okay, do we have another question? Um, yeah, we have another one, uh, just a comment in here. Um, but first I wanna mention, I'm pushing this tech tips. What I'm looking for is what, what you learned from Kenny, what was the top thing you learned from Kenny this year that you think he should share with other people? I guess that's sort of how I should have phrased the question. So add this to the, to the comments. We were getting some good ones in here. Uh, Joe Johnson is a long one, but uh, he's he has a comment. He says, looking forward to seeing Kenny's building uh, 1970 Mustang with his front and rear grip pick K-Link and front SLA. It would be a lightweight car, which would be fast and handle well with 580 horsepower Coyote. There'd be very few cars that could stay with him. <laughs> Joe, that is so true. Yeah, except I'm, I'm, I'm going to put a caveat in there. I mean, I, in, in those older cars, <clears throat> I know Coyote, you know, Coyote, 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 that's what everybody does. But, you know, I, I still like the Windsors. I mean, I, I started working on Mustangs and Windsors, and you can do so much with them anymore. I mean, you can get a, 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 a 363 small block, like based on the 302 uh, uh, block, uh, 363 and 500 horsepower. I mean, you can just buy them right off the shelf. And the thing is that Coyote motor, I mean, the, the Windsor is so, so much more compact than the Coyote, plus they make a whole bunch more torque. So, I mean, I'd be, if somebody wanted a Coyote, I, I'd do that, but I, I just, for those older cars, I just, I just love those Windsors. Uh, well, we did like for, for David's uh, AIX car out in California, uh, he wanted something different. He's a 2012 or 13 Mustang. He's got a full AGS 4.5 with the uh, uh, GRZ, oh, actually he's got GRZ Motorsport shocks on it because this is, this is a full on race car. And what I did for that is I had Wagner up in uh, Wisconsin, Wagner Race Engines, built an all aluminum, a 351 stroke adapter 408. Uh, and it's, I mean, and it dry sump and it's like 650 horsepower, 580 on torque. I mean, it's, it's going to be a monster motor. And, you know, being all aluminum, it's going to be probably lighter than a Coyote. I don't know that for sure, just my guess, but it's kind of like he sent me pictures. And you put, you put a Windsor motor in an S197 and it looks lost. And that sounds like, where's the motor? So and anyway, it's the earlier cars, I mean, I'd, you get really nice three, uh, was it the 337s, uh, 363s. Uh, I mean, that's, that's what I would do. Uh, I, I just kind of like them. But, you know, Coyote's still okay too. Uh, Illuminator. With what what they are about five something horsepower, I mean that that'd be uh, pretty pretty snappy. So, yeah, I mean it's it's like uh, uh, I got a lot of people who would like to see this happen. Uh, the thing that would speed it up is uh, having uh, more significant interest, uh, like people that would uh, uh, either want to get involved or put a, de a deposit down. Uh, that all, you know, we always go in the direction of market demand. Uh, so we ever had some people that were really interested uh, in in that uh, that would that would make that uh, project go a, a little quicker. So, okay, so this is last call for uh, any questions you have. Um, I can't believe it's the end of the hour. I thought you'd only go a half hour today, Ken. You know how to gab. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Once I get going, I get going. <laughs> You sure do. We have another couple of questions here, but um, just wanted to remind you about uh, the 15 minute uh, to schedule a 15 minute consult with Kenny. It's free. Um, he shares a lot of information. If you have a specific questions that you need to, you don't know how to get through, just uh, schedule a 15 minute and he'll talk through, through that with you. Also, he can help you uh, put together a build plan, what to do next, how to, how to build your, your uh, car specifically for how you're using it. So, um, yeah, let, let me get back to Joe for a second because I'm thinking a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you know anybody with a, with a, a 69 or 70 Mustang that would, would, would like to uh, get involved in the, the AGS 5.0 system on the car, because it's just, it's like the entire, <laughs> it's like the entire system from the 197s. We're going to like transfer the double wishbone in the back, the, you know, the four link with a, with a K link in the, in, in the, in the back and, and the double wishbone in the front. And also we're gonna carry over our K Brown Bear brakes, uh, our shock package, uh, wheel and tire package. So it's basically gonna be an S197 
a devil wishbone S197 underneath the 6970 Mustang, which I think is going to be way cool. But uh, if you know anybody that might be interested, have them get in touch with me. The reason we're starting with 6970s is because what I, I really want to do is build uh, some 6970 uh, Trans Am spec racer. Okay, did you get that? As track cars and also for SVRA. Uh, that would be, you know, uh, 6970 Trans Am spec racer. Uh, they, you know, they had that full... They, instead of the street brakes, they get our Pro 4R race brakes, uh, race shocks. And then what we're talking about is engines in like the, the 400 cubic inch range, uh, five, 500 plus horsepower. And the reason I want to go to, you know, to 400 cubes is if we get a bigger motor that, that's got more torque, we don't have to ring, it, ring the neck of it uh, to make a lot of power and the engines will last longer. So you get, you know, more than a season out of it. So anybody that might be interested in, in a, a Trans Am spec racer, either for track days or for SVRA, uh, you know, hook them up with me and we'll, we'll talk. Okay. We also have Bill Haney's in the, the group, Kenny. He's a, one of our uh, current Speed Therapy Academy members. Um, hey, so I, hey. And let's see, we also have, I'm just going to go through a couple of tech tips and then we have another question here from Kobe. Again, if you have any, this is last call for any questions uh, that you may have. Um, let's see. So this is just a couple of them. One of the, which I thought was interesting, tech tip number one for me was have a build plan. Yeah, that's really important. I mean, that's, and when I talk about all the things like in the academy and the workshops, uh, when, when you want to do performance, on your car, uh, you need to have a plan. And by plan, you need to, you know, what I tell people is where do you want to be? Where do you want the project to end? Of course, things like never really end, but where would you like to see kind of sort of like the, the end result? And then you have to just plan backwards from that because the worst thing you want to do is just throw, throw parts at it. And then when you want to make an upgrade, well, crap, I got to throw this away, put something else on. So if you know where you're going to be and you work backwards and I can help you with that, then, you know, you're adding things that keep making the, the, you know, the package better. Uh, and so you don't have to work backward and move backwards. You're always moving forwards. So, yeah, I mean, a build plan is really, really important. And, and Tim Thomas, asked, hi, Tim. Uh, Tim has a tech tip that he thought was important. Uh, what to measure and adjust when at the track? When at a track. Okay, that's a good so. one. Yep, that's a really good one. And we also have, I thought we had, and Colby Ward, oh, that's his question, I think. I'm losing it right here. I'll find another one. But anyway, Colby Ward says, for the autocross cross, cross torque question, possibly a gear change might help? Uh, sure. I mean, it's just, you need, need to just try. Uh, you know, you have, to be, you have to be careful when you're choosing your gears. If you go too low, then you might you might actually lose traction because there's too much of a mechanical mechanical advantage. It's just a matter of depending on the type of courses you, you run on. You sort of have to find that happy medium where you got really great acceleration, but but don't have too much of a mechanical advantage through the lower gear ratio that you're just spinning the tires all the time. So yeah, I mean that that you, you can do it with gears too. I mean it's like like anything else. Uh, if you've got a specific application, you have to think about it. You have to plan. And, you know, what I tell people before you make any change, like in a track car, uh, autocross car, a street car, before you make any change, be sure that you are looking for a specific outcome. Okay. Because you know, the, the worst people, the, the worst thing people do is they just, somebody else did this, so I'm going to do it. You know, that guy did something else, I'm going to do it. I mean, you need to be thinking about you're making a change. What is the outcome that I'm looking for? What result do I want to see? Uh, so if, you, if you're looking for, you know, looking at gears, take a look at the gears you've got and then, you know, do, do some math. Uh, maybe not go too deep in gears. I mean, you just got to come to the point. Unfortunately, it's like anything else, trial and error. I mean, engineering race cars uh, is, is trial and error. Uh, you know, if, if once... You know, I, I, I've done it so much 
that I can make a couple adjustments at the same time. But it's like years and years ago, it was trial and error. Uh, try this, and what was the result? I'd write it down my notebook, remember notebooks. Uh, write it down my notebook, whether it worked or didn't. And you know, you, you get to the point where you get things working. So uh, anything like that, again, is, is trial and error. Uh, and you need to trial and error for your application and your car and your driving style. Okay, and so uh, Steve uh, Duvall here. Uh, hey, Kenny, do you remember Steve? He used to work uh, be mechanic for us back in the nineties. Oh yeah. So, so anyway, he has he says the best tech tip for him was uh, I ever learned from Kenny was document everything, every change you make. He mentioned it a few episodes back, but this year, uh, but he taught me that in the early nineties. So, and then uh, Joe yeah, John, you can see, uh, you know, I've, and, and that's something again I, I learned years and years ago. Uh, doing my own cars. And it's because I, I would, you know, back in the 70s, I was just, you know, young and excited and just really, really ready to go. And I, I make changes and do things on the race cars. And it's like, I wouldn't remember what I did. So I actually, you know, started, you know, writing things down in notebooks. Because if you, if you make a change or you do something on your car at the track or autocross or even on the street, and you think you're going to remember it later, you won't. I guarantee you won't. So, yeah, you write everything down. Okay. Thanks for, uh, uh, you know, kind of piping in on that. Okay, okay. then here, here's Joe Johnson. Uh, the best tip for me was uh, was Kenny showing me what I was doing wrong when entering a curb using the whole track with late braking and getting more speed after ex exiting the uh, curve. Yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, real speed, is, it's all about corner exit speed. Because the, the faster you exit the corner, the faster you will be at the end of the straightaway. It's just plain and simple. And that, that's how I blow past GT500s at Road America. I and mean, coming off turn three, I mean, I've got, you know, I, I do a real late apex and my foot is down. I'm carrying a, a lot of mid-corner speed and a big corner exit speed. With the GT500s, because they're so heavy, uh, they're not as quick to the middle of the corner. And then because they have so much torque, they can't put their foot down or they light their tires up. So they sort of have to wait till the axle settles and then, you know, feather the gas until they get about halfway down the story before they can put their foot down. By that time, I'm gone. So, yeah, I mean, it's like late break, good rotation, get on the gas soon, get on the gas before the apex and get a good drive off the corner. And I mean, that'll, that's the quickest way to pick up lap times. Okay, and then oh, just a real quick shout out uh, to uh, Dan Neve. Uh, he's uh, joining us again. He had a very busy summers. Um, as uh, many people know, he uh, is the founder of uh, Cruise for a Cause. And this year he gave away a, what did he give away, Kenny? A G, not, uh, GT500. A GT5, yeah, Shelby GT500. And so that was specially des designed just for Cruise for a Cause. So, um, I, and I'm sure he raised a lot of money. Dan, I haven't seen how much money you've raised on that. If, you, if you've uh, announced that, put it in the comments, please. Anyway, uh, great to have you back, Dan, and you do wonderful things, you and Linda. Let's see. I think that is it for today. Um, so I think, again, if you uh, want Kenny to talk, again, I want to talk about uh, Christmas uh, weekend and New Year's weekend. Uh, we are going to, Kenny's going to be going through the top, 10 tech tips of this year that he offered people. So if you have anything he, you think is uh, valid for that, just uh, give me a call or send it in. We have some, quite a few right now, Kenny, so we may already have our 10. Um, okay. And then you can, you can evaluate and see if you want to add something else again. Uh, so uh, join us Christmas uh, Christmas weekend and New Year's weekend and uh, for Kenny's top 10 tips for 2021. I think that should be pretty good. So uh, with that, uh, we will. Okay, what am I going to talk about next week? I don't know. <laughs> you guys tell me what you want me to talk about next week. I mean, like today, you know, the, uh, all the topics came right from the questions from the Kenny Brown Speed Therapy Society private Facebook group. I got that all in. Uh, all the questions came from there. Uh, well, except Ben, he came from the Speed Therapy Academy. Uh, but, uh, yeah, let me know what you'd like me to talk about, uh, any subjects or send your questions in. You know, I turn questions into subject as you see, like I did today. Uh, and, uh, you know, I talk about what you want to know about. I mean, that's uh, the whole purpose of this. 
is also to give you quality information. You know, I tell people, you know, the, the two worst places to get information about your car is the paddock and the internet. Uh, there's, there's so much, that's why I started Cars and Coffee. I mean, I just got totally sick of all the, the misinformation that I saw out there, like on the forums and stuff. I don't, I don't, I, I gave up looking at those years ago because it just drive me crazy, you know, how much bad information there was. And if you try to correct anybody, well, then that, that's just, it, it turns into a pissing match because they know more than you do. So that's why I started Cars and Coffee. This, I mean, I, I got a lot of experience, you know, I made a lot of mistakes. And then you know, the mistakes that I made, I can help you not to make. So with that, I think we will call it a day unless a late, a late uh, question came in. And uh, uh, for everybody, we're going to have a pretty decent weekend here. The sun's shining, uh, not too hot, not too cold. Uh, so it's kind of going to enjoy the day. Uh, it'll be a nice day to get a car out, but i, I got too much, too much other things to do. So listen, thank you very much for joining. Uh, again, I hope you learned something. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm here. I'm here for you guys. Uh, you know, let me know what you want to want me to talk about next week, and uh, I'll I'll create uh, I'll create an episode that that, that that covers what you want to know about. So with that have a good rest of your weekend, everybody. Uh, glad you could join me. I'm really happy to see you all, and especially all the people that come often. And don't forget, you can share this. You know, you can hit some buttons and share this. So you can actually have a, a a group share a group on Facebook anyway. Uh, so please share this with your buddies. The more, the merrier. Uh, it'd be really nice if we could build up our our, uh, our our people, our audience a little more. That always helps. So you know, please uh, find some more people to join me next Saturday. If, that's your job, okay? Uh, you got two jobs. One is to send me questions, so I have something to talk about. And the second is to get some of your friends to join us next Saturday morning. So with that, I, I'm leave you with your two jobs to do before next week. I'm going to see how you do on that. So have a good rest of your weekend. Bye, everybody.